The problem of evil is meant to show that God doesn't exist, that it's not possible for the two things to be compatible, but could it be the case that the existence of evil actually proves the opposite, proves that God does exist? Let's consider. Hello, philosophers. I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. And we've been looking at the logical problem of evil so far, which goes something like this. If God exists, he could prevent evil because he's all-powerful, all-knowing. If God exists, he would prevent evil because he's all good. So therefore, if God exists, evil doesn't exist. But evil does exist, therefore God does not exist. Now, what's interesting is premise four there. Premise four is a pretty bold claim. The person that would be making that claim would be so confident that evil is a thing that exists that this person would be willing to reject the very possibility that God exists. But what is it to assert for? What does it mean to say that evil exists? First, any claim that evil exists automatically is normative. It automatically says, you know, there is some kind of standard and you either do or do not meet that standard. And this is in the case of morality. You know, if you meet the standard, we call that good. If you don't, we call that evil. Now, we can consider two different kinds of, of evils and just to sort of put some meat on the bones of evil exists. And uh, the first kind we'll, we'll talk about is people, evil people. So consider the statement Adolf Hitler is evil. Now, what that means is that Adolf Hitler, there's some kind of standard to what persons should be, and Adolf Hitler fails to meet that standard. If he met that standard, he would be a good person, but he's not, so he is an evil person. He didn't meet that standard. Um, and I use Adolf Hitler because most people will agree that he was an evil person if there is such a thing as evil. And remember, four is the claim that evil exists here. So, you know, that's not the claim that I'm making. It's the claim that the problem of evil makes. One other possible kind of evil would be a, an evil action. Uh, again, I didn't actually come up with these examples. These are examples that, for some reason, philosophers have come up. I don't know why, because most people will agree on them. But if I'm not sadistic enough to come up with this one. Consider the proposition, torturing babies for fun is evil. And my wife automatically asked me, why Why for fun? Just Isn't torturing babies for, just wrong in general? Uh, yeah, I agree. But you, know, you could say, what if it were to save the world? Some mad scientist would blow up the world if you didn't torture them. I'm not saying you should, or I'm not saying that it's good that you do, but you know, like that's the for fun part. That's why that's why that's theirs. Because everybody can kind of agree, yeah, that if anything's evil, torturing babies for fun is evil. So there's some standard for actions, some some way that actions should be, and this doesn't reach that standard. That's why we call it evil. If it were an action that didn't meet that standard, we'd call it good. So any claim that evil exists is automatically a normative claim just by definition. That's just an analytical truth. But first, what kind of normativity is this? What kind of standard are we talking about? And the first kind of distinction we can make is whether it is a subjective or an objective standard. So um, the, the subjective standard is one that is totally dependent upon the mind or the minds of those that are making up the standard in the first place. Uh, so for example, you could have just like cultural norms. I had a boss that loved to start off group meetings. Well, she was a great boss, loved the boss, but uh, she loved, she, she started off with uh, accepted group norms. So we discussed, you know, what we thought would be reasonable way to conduct meetings. And uh, she, she threw out the idea that we could, I, I mean, I, again, I love my boss, but yeah, I had to kind of sit back and watch when she said, maybe we'll have a talking stick that we can. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, um, that didn't that didn't actually happen. But the, the idea was that could have been one of our norms. We could have agreed on that standard and said, you know, a good meeting for us will be one which we conducted in this way. But notice, is there a right way to conduct these kinds of meetings? No. I mean, there's no right way outside of what we agreed on. We just wrote out a list of here's what we're going to do. And that's what we followed. Another example of a subjective standard would be a taboo, especially like a cultural or even a personal taboo. So for me, I can't stand cockroaches. That's like my snakes for Indiana Jones. I, I was this little kid growing up a slide on uh, Louisiana for, for like three years. We lived there when I was a kid and uh, the cockroaches. Oh, I put my, my, soccer cleats outside in the garage, 
put one on one day and I felt a little squirming. Oh, kicked it off. And this guy popped out, looked over at me and then ran away ever since then, man. And I know that there are places where people eat cockroaches. And for me, I, oh, there's just, that is not normal for me, right? I say that that's wrong. But is that objectively wrong? You know, is is there a wrong thing that's going on when somebody eats a cockroach? No, that's just a personal norm that I have that I would have a hard time getting over if I lived in one of those societies. Uh, but there's nothing that's outside there, you know, like some law, thou shalt not eat cockroaches. That's just something that exists inside of my own mind. So those are sub subjective standards. They only exist in the mind's uh, of those people that hold them. Now, this would be as opposed to standards that are objective. And objective standards exist whether or not we agree on them, right? Whether or not we believe in them, they don't exist solely in the minds of, of those that hold them. So a good example of this would be the standard of rationality. You know, there are laws of logic, whether or not we all agree that there are, whether or not we can agree on how it is that we know them, or maybe we don't even totally know them. But one way or another, there are laws of what makes sense in reasoning. You know, you have to use words that that are not just gibberish. You have to avoid contradicting yourself. There's all these kinds of little rules that we have, right? And if you meet those criteria, then you're rational. If not, then you're not being rational, you're irrational. And it doesn't matter if you believe in them or not, that's just the standard, right? That's just what it is. Another example of an objective standard and one that's come under a lot of contention recently for, for possibly good reasons, um, but I think I can give very drastic examples to show how this would be objective, at least in some ways, is the word healthy. So we can say that getting exercise and eating spinach is healthy for humans and uh, being totally sedentary and breathing in large amounts of carbon dioxide, dioxide is unhealthy for humans, um, but healthy for trees. So there is, you know, whether or not we believe it, whether or not we agree on it, there are definitely some things that are healthy and some things that are not. If you are not sedentary, if you are getting exercise, if you are breathing the proper amount of oxygen, eating well, whatever it is, then you're healthy. If not, then you are unhealthy. Really, nothing really rides on this actually being true or not. You know, I'm, I'm just using this as heuristic examples. So if, if there is no objective standard of healthiness, great. Uh, uh, hopefully it shows you what I mean, though, by an objective standard. Now, let's consider premise four here. Now, what kind of standard does four appeal to? Is saying that evil exists subjective or objective? Well, hopefully you could see that looking at this argument right off the bat, it becomes evident that it's got to be an objective standard. Um, the subjective standard is just not going to give you what you want in, in the problem of evil. And the reason is because the subjective standards never reach beyond the subjects, right? They never reach beyond the people in whose minds these standards e exist. So since God is not one of these people, then it doesn't hold him obliged to those standards. Um, the We could say that, you know, God should respect the subjective standards of others. The problem is that that is an objective standard. You know, that is saying this is what God should do and it reaches beyond the subjects to uh, that different person, God. So, um, yeah, it seems like four has got to be uh, a, an objective standard. And here are a few more arguments to hopefully help you to see that. First of all, if we're talking about uh, subjective standards and the existence of God, ex hypothesi, God would be creating the subjects that create these subjective standards. You know, if, if you believe that it's wrong to eat cockroaches, then God is creating you, and then you are creating these standards of no cockroach eating, and yet there is cockroach eating in the world. If God creates you, then at the time of God's creation, you haven't created those standards yet, so those standards don't even exist. So there's no way for those standards to apply to God. Now, I think you could argue, you could respond to that possibly, that yeah, but God would know ahead of time what kinds of standards we would have when we did exist. Um, so, and maybe, yeah, God should respect those standards, but 
again, that is an objective standard to say this is what God should do back then. And back then, our subjective standards, again, don't exist. Another way we can argue this is to look how the standard is applied throughout the different premises of the problem of evil argument in the first place. So again, subjective standards don't exist outside of the minds of those that hold them. So in a way, I mean, that's purely imaginary, right? Like that's like the definition of imaginaries only exists in your mind. Uh, so they don't have any sway on persons outside of those subjects. Now, premise two holds that God would do certain things because he is good, right? Now that is clearly applying an objective standard to God. And then premise four talks about evil. If premise four were then a subjective standard, we would have an equivocation here. We would have two terms that look the same, but are actually being used totally different ways. So in order for the problem of evil to function as an argument in the first place, we have to have consistency throughout. We have to have number four, premise four, evil exists, be an objective standard of evil if it's going to match up with premise two. So premise four, that evil exists, is an objective standard applied to the universe. Otherwise, the problem of evil just doesn't, it's not a problem in the first place. So good and evil are being used in the problem of evil in an objective way, but what makes them a moral objective standard rather than just an objective? We talked about objective standards like healthy and rational. And there are actually some philosophers that hold that morality is tied up in those two concepts. So eudaimonists think what it is to be uh, good is to uh, do what is conducive to human flourishing or well-being. And uh, Kantians are very big into rationality. So what is the right thing to do is whatever it is that you could rationally wish that all people would do. Um, and so you could come up with ethical systems that way. But notice there's always something missing. You know, again, think about our Adolf Hitler example. I might say um, in the eudaimonist system, Adolf Hitler, what are you doing, buddy? Like you are committing genocide. You know, that's not going to be conducive to your well-being. That's not going to help you flourish. So, okay, thanks. Or think about, you know, our, our torturing babies for fun. You know, Kant could come out and admonish those baby torturers and say, what is you, what are you doing? There, uh, I don't have a good German accent, so I'll just stop right there. What are you doing? Um, what you're doing is not a rational thing to do. Okay, and? In other words, you still need this element of should. You need something to say that you should be rational or that you should pursue your well-being. So not only do we need an objective standard for premise four in the problem of evil here, but we also need an obligatory element. We need it to say, yeah, this is an objective standard and it's the way things should be. That's part of what it is to be uh, claiming something that is evil or good. So I'll, I'll be using the term obligatory here to mean something like that element of should, whatever that is. It'll be a sloppy term to just sort of fudge around that idea. So given that definition of obligatory, uh, we can hold the following claim is true analytically speaking, just by definition uh, of what the word evil means. If evil exists, then an objective, obligatory standard of being exists. But what is the source of this obligatoriness? You know, where do we get this should from? First, I should say, I, before I give you my first argument, I know that some of you are anarchists and believe that there's no such thing as a uh, an obligatory law. All laws are illegitimate, and that's totally fine. Really, I'm just using this to show you what the concept of obligation entails. Um, so imagine we have uh, a bunch of bird sippers. Have you guys ever seen bird sippers that, you know, they there's like a, a cup, oh, sorry, there's a cup of water and they just sort of toot, 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 and they sip the water. And uh, imagine we had a bunch of those guys and we'd have to motorize them because I think that they, they need to actually be sipping the water to move. I, I don't really know. But let's say we have a bunch of those guys all around a keyboard. Each one, you know, is lined up with one key and we set them at random speeds. And so they're just sort of clacking away. Well, imagine that we let them go for uh, a super long amount of time. They would come up with a lot of gibberish, but amongst that gibberish, 
likely or arguably speaking, we would have some intelligible stuff. Imagine one of those things that came out of there was an entire system of laws, an entire system of laws with our country's name on it, right? I realize not everybody's from the U.S., but for me, I'm in the United States. So imagine said, you know, these are the laws for the people of the United States. Are we obliged to follow those laws? Are we like, dang, man, well, I guess I got to follow. I mean, it says people of the United States. Um, doesn't seem like it. But now imagine instead, uh, totally independently of this and, and un, unbeknownst to us that this actually happened, everybody in our country came all together, including, you know, legislative branches and if we have kings, kings and whatever it is, every single person and not just the majority, but every person uh, from the tall to the small all agree that uh, on a certain set of laws, and it happens to be the identical set that the Sippy Birds came up with. Um, now are we obliged to follow these laws? Uh, again, you may think, no, all laws are, are ridiculous. But at the very least, the idea of an obligation to these laws makes sense, right? Whereas an obligation to the Sippy Birds how does that even make sense? In other words, in order for us to have some kind of obligation, the standard requires an intelligent maker of that standard. But now let's consider morality and not the law. Morality is something that happens that the law is subjective. You know, the law, we can have different laws in, in different nations and um, I'm, there's going to be bad laws for sure, but you can have uh, different sets of laws and it's not like there's one that, you know, this has got to be the law for everybody. So morality is a little bit different. And like we said, in the problem of evil, we're appealing to a, an objective standard here. Um, what makes it obligatory then has got to be that it comes from an intelligent maker. But then, you know, this happens, morality happens before we come along, right? Morality happens before we have decided here's what we want to be moral or not. And again, that would be subjective in the first place. So it seems like in order for our standard to be obligatory, it would have to come from an intelligent maker. And uh, there's another way we can argue for the same point, I think. And it goes like this. Uh, imagine now we are, are computer programmers and we want to program a video game. And there are two languages that you can program in, JavaScript and BlavaScript. JavaScript was created by other computer programmers, and they came up with a bunch of commands, and they came out with, you know, uh, a format in writing stuff, all that kind of stuff. And BlavaScript is also a programming language, but let's say this wasn't the product of... Uh, programmers. This was a product of a glitch. So the computer just sort of spit this thing out. And, you know, here we, we come out with this program, it, you know, I don't know, lightning hit it just the right way. And it has its own commands too. And it works, but there was no kind of intelligence that, that came behind that. Now, imagine I'm trying to program something, working to, we're working together, and I'm using JavaScript, and you see a mistake. Now, you could either say, hey, that's not going to work. Or you could say, yeah, that's not the right way of doing that, you know. And both of those things are going to make sense. But now imagine instead I'm writing Blava script. And you can say, again, that's not going to work. But could you really say that's not the right way of doing it? No, if you think about it, the right way of doing it would be the way that the maker of that language intended. And if there's no maker of the language, then there is no intended. So the very concept of a standard that has that should, this is the right way of doing it or the wrong way of doing it, implies that that standard was made by an intelligent maker. Now, I, I think that you can go from there and argue this, this so... I mean, where we're going here is the moral argument for the existence of God. And the moral argument for the existence of God says, you know, if uh, morality exists, then God must exist. And I think you can go from, from this premise here and continue on just on your happy way. But I, I kind of like to go a little bit deeper, and, and here's what I mean. I personally think that there is a problem for what I'll call here externalists. Externalists are systems of morality, at least in, in, in morality, a moral philosophy, 
Externalists believe that the locus of obligation is external to the thing that is obligated. And I think, and so for example, you could have like a, a moral law that permeates the universe. Uh, and it's just, you know, this is the set of laws and they exist and they're out there and you have to follow them, but they're not inside of you necessarily. You know, they're not uh, residing in you or something like that. Or even like the rights of others, you know, uh, they would rule over what you can or cannot do, but they're not you, they're those other people. Even if you might have the same rights, you know, it's their rights that you're worried about tripping over. So those are externalist views of uh, the locus of moral obligation. And I think there's a problem here um, that I'll call the regress problem. And it's this. How does the obligation attach to me if I'm being obligated? So, for example, let, let's take that moral law permeating the universe. Let's say there's this moral law, thou shalt not torture babies for fun. And um, I say, okay, sweet. There's there's this moral law out there. Now what? Do I have to follow that? Or are you going to make me follow that? And you say, no, you should follow it. Okay, I should follow it. Why should I follow it? Well, um, there's nothing about me that you can appeal to. It's this thing that's external to me that's that's coming from outside saying, yeah, this is what you should do. So um, I, I might say, yeah, why should I? And it seems like the only answer you can give is to, to point to a different external law. Say, there is this additional law that thou shalt follow all laws that the moral law out there uh, shouts you, you know, that makes you do. And it seems like we've run into the same problem though. I can ask, Oh really? Okay. Why should I follow that law? And you'll have to say, well, there's this third law that says you should follow that one, you know, and we're going to have an infinite regress. So it seems like there's no foothold for these externalist systems. And as we have it here, this sure sounds like a, a purely externalist system. This is, it sounds like a divine command theory system, if you've heard of what those are. And this has been an objection that's been leveled at them. And I think it's a legit objection. Um, I think there's incidentally also a problem with internalists, um, which is that there seems to be no bite to them. You know, like if, so if the locus of my moral obligation is just inside of me, if that's the reason why I shouldn't commit genocide, um, because you know, I, I'm obliged to myself, I might just sort of wave myself off like, yeah, well, that's okay. Uh, forgive me. Yeah, no big deal. Um, whereas if, you know, I'm beholden to somebody else, then it, it's not so easy to be waved off like that. So I think um, the internalists have this problem, but never fear. What we're again, we're going. What we're going for this is the moral argument for the existence of God, and I think we have a unique solution here in the doctrine of creation. And by creation, I mean creation out of nothing, not just uh, making new stuff. So here's what I mean: in creation. You know, God creates all other things besides himself. He's always existed, so he doesn't, you know, require a creator. But all other things begin to exist, so they require creators. And God creates everything. That would include the very natures themselves, you know. So he creates human nature. And in human nature, he could create this standard, this objective standard. Of this is what it is to be a good human, so there's your externalist aspect, right? There's that intelligent maker of the thing um, that that makes that standard. And then God not only creates the human nature, but creates uh, the very being of humans themselves. So he's creating, you know, the very substance there. He's able to endue that nature into the humans. So it's sort of like he's got this blueprint and since he's creating everything about you, the blueprint is, you know, part of your very being. So it's as internalist as you can be as well. It's it's a moral obligation that resides inside of you. So again, I think this is a, a unique doctrine in that it gets you like this perfect meld of internalism and externalism. It gives you all the stuff that you want without having uh, any of the problems. So I think... An additional premise here is helpful if our standard is an obligatory one and it was from an intelligent maker, then that intelligent maker would have had to be 
a creator of all things. You know, so therefore, if evil exists, then an intelligent creator exists. But we got from that premise four in the problem of evil that evil exists. Therefore, an intelligent creator exists, and we would just call that God. That is the moral argument for the existence of God. And what's interesting about it is it takes the same premise that the problem of evil uses to disprove the existence of God, and it proves the existence of God. Now, if any of the stuff that we've said before about the problem of evil was convincing, then the problem of evil has sort of dissipated. But what hasn't disappeared is that claim, that claim that evil exists. So that is interesting. Um, how could we possibly respond to that? Um, I think one thing we could do is to say, well, instead of evil exists, what I meant to say was suffering exists. Um, and then you can run the whole problem of evil as the problem of suffering. The problem with that, I think, is that saying suffering exists loses the obligatory part. So you no longer have it be the case in premise two that God would avoid suffering because, you know, he's obliged to avoid suffering. If it just says that, you know, that God would avoid suffering, I could say, why? Is that a bad thing? Well, no, technically speaking, I can't say that it's a bad thing. Well, then why would he avoid it? Well, I don't know. So I'm going to have to insist that we keep that as evil exists. So I think there are two possible answers, two possible responses to um, taking that, that premise four from the problem of evil and plugging it in here into the moral argument. The first could be to say, just throw up your hands and say, well, then I, I change my mind. I no longer say that evil exists. The problem is, if there is no other reason to believe that God doesn't exist, right? And, and I know that there are arguments from science that, you know, we don't need God to explain the universe, but those are, are irrelevant to what we're talking about now, because those are arguments for agnosticism, that we don't know whether God exists or not. They're not arguments to say that God doesn't exist. So if there are no other arguments uh, that are standing here to say that God doesn't exist, then we would be throwing out this claim that evil exists purely to avoid belief in God. And that's special pleading, right? You're not, allowed, you're not allowed to just be like, well, I don't want to believe in that. Well, throw this out. So um, I think that would be the problem with that solution. Another possible solution is to say, well, when I said evil exists, I didn't mean that it actually exists. What I meant was, if God existed, then these things would be evil things. You know, then morality would exist and all this stuff we could say was bad stuff and it shouldn't exist. And therefore, he, he would have to, you know, uh, fix all of it. I think the problem with that is that, again... If God doesn't exist and this standard doesn't exist, then there's no way for us to say what the standard would be if he did exist, right? There's no way for us to go, yeah, well, this would be the right thing. Why? Why would this be the right thing rather than another thing? Another possible way that we could respond to that then is to say, well, what I didn't mean was evil actually exists. What I meant would say was that if God exists, then these things would be evil things, but God doesn't exist, so they're not actually evil. And I think the problem with that is that if God doesn't exist, then there is no way things would be if he did exist, right? Because what, what we're thinking here is, like, it's hard to get out of the mindset of this is what's right and wrong, you know? And if we're going to say there is no such thing as right and wrong, if there is no actual evil exists, then um, likely what we're saying is, hey, these are the things I don't like. And if God existed, they would be wrong. And he wouldn't. Why would they be wrong? Why would torturing babies for fun be a wrong thing? I mean, I know I don't like it, but if it's not wrong now, then we have no way of saying it would be wrong if God existed. So I don't think that we can make those kinds of claims. I don't think we can say like, yeah, if God existed, here's how morality would be. There is no way to do that. So I don't think that would be a, a good solution either. So I think we're stuck with that evil exists claim. There are another couple of objections, I think, that always show up when you talk about the moral argument. And there are these that, number one, if the moral argument's right, that would mean that 
there is no such thing as a good atheist, and clearly there have been good atheists. And number two, that would mean that there's no such thing as an atheist ethical system, and we can see a bunch of ethical systems that exist that are atheistic. And I think both of those are red herrings. You know, The argument is not saying that you have to believe in God to be good or evil, and it's not saying that you have to believe in God in order to get a set of rules and even possibly get the right set of rules. The argument saying what makes those set of rules the objectively true obligatory rules is that they are ground in God's creation of us, whether you know that or not. And, and here's an analogy that I have. I played basketball in high school uh, very poorly, and unfortunately for me, because uh, I love the sport. It wasn't until like a few days ago, I had to look it up, but and I'll have to read it off actually, the National Federation of State High School Associations. Yeah, I didn't know that existed, but apparently they created the rules for high school basketball. Didn't know. Now, I could play basketball in high school and not have any idea that these guys existed. I might not even be totally aware of all the rules, right? I could even come up with a set of rules myself and play like lunchtime basketball. Could we play dunk ball? We, we had like the eight foot rims, so we would go dunk on those. And uh, you could come up with your own set of rules for lunchtime basketball. And you might even come up with the exact same ones that the NFHS, I think it is. Um, I don't know. how is that? That's right. Yeah. It seems like you're missing a lot of letters in that acronym, bud. But you could come up with rules that are identical to the NFHSs and still uh, not know that they exist. You might even deny that they exist. You might think this is, yeah, we just came up with these rules and we just happen to all play by that. Yeah, you could do that for your, in fact, that's what I actually did. I just thought, I don't know what I really thought, but I just thought, yeah, these are the rules we're playing by. And I don't know, I guess I never really thought about who had them or not. So it's not the case that in order for you to be good, you have to believe in or know the creator of good. It's not the case that for you to play by the moral rules you have to know of or believe in the uh, moral rule maker. You can do all those things just fine. The point of this argument is that there must be this intelligent creator, not that you have to believe in it or know it, or you could even deny that he exists. In any case, that's the moral argument for the existence of God and how it relates to the problem of evil. Here's This is what I really found interesting about it is, is that the same shared premise goes sort of both ways. And I think if you assert it in one area, you have to stick with it in the other area on pain of this special pleading. In any case, if you have any questions on that, please hit me up. I'd love to answer any questions. And otherwise, I will see you guys in the next video. Adios. Adios.